She's now Dr. Watson. <laughs> 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 no, 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 no. It shouldn't be embarrassing. This good. <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm, I'm Dr. Fred, it cost me $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we love a white hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you for the welcome. And um, I um, have been asked to talk a little bit about um, uh, what makes good meetings, what works in groups, what doesn't work in groups, and how do we um, uh, learn a bit more about um, the joys of working in groups rather than the, the difficulties. I'd like also to start by acknowledging that we're on the Royal Land too. It's important to recognise custodians um, and their ongoing connection to the country and um, all the things that we can learn from, from them about looking after this place. So um, a little bit about my background. Um, Bob kind of said I need, need no introduction, but um, a, 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 apart from perhaps people knowing that I'm involved in the Greens and I've been... Um, in the Parliament for a while and am and, and now um, uh, out and <laughs> causing trouble outside, um, is that my, my background was also in um, uh, training in group facilitation and, and um, non-violence, so that is, is also very much part of um, <clears throat> the work I did um, uh, before being in Parliament. And, Interesting to try and take the concepts of consensus into a into a parliament, which is all about adversarial um, politics. But make a difference. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd start. Uh, I mean, I've got about forty-five minutes, and might, I might ask Barb to just keep a bit of a. Oh, actually, I'll stay out. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fine. Uh, the clock is clock visible. Um, I might sort of throw out some ideas for 10, 15 minutes and then we'll have a you know, more of an interactive sort of opportunity. Um, and I thought what we might try and do is uh, throw up uh, some of the um, uh, things that have already come up in the groups that you're in and see if there's some problem solving and uh, advice that can be shared because often what we find is the things that are happening in your group, uh, funnily enough, they've happened in another group before and, you know, uh, it's actually about how we interact as, as people in groups and uh, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot of shared knowledge and wisdom here in the room. So that is part of the trick is knowing where to find some of the answers to the challenges that come out. So I think um, uh, obviously what draws all of you here is uh, an interest in transition tactics, which um, is a fantastic move. I really have to say once I saw this emerging I thought this is, this is great. And it's great because it's also not about only about achieving outcomes in terms of uh, you know, sustainable lifestyles and um, how we move forward um, out of a dependency on, on fossil fuels and all those kind of objectives. It's also about uh, reconnecting and rebuilding uh, as community. And so it's a win-win. It's a um, and one of the things that can happen if uh, people are attracted to a particular issue or a particular outcomes is, you know, they're all very excited about here's where we need to be, but how we get there isn't necessarily that straightforward. Um, so um, one of the kind of things to, to have in your mind is, is, is a bit of wisdom, which I think is, I don't know where it came from, but uh, it's certainly part of the, of the sort of conversation around um, group work is it's really important to begin with the end in mind and we can get very bogged down in the kind of details of, uh, um, uh, of the work and we need to start from a point where we've got some very common agreements about um, where we're trying to get to and if that work isn't done within the group to start with then you're going to not surprisingly uh, end up with uh, a degree of confusion about priorities and, and uh, what's, what, what needs to be done first and what can be left to later. Um, and um, I'm reminded of a particular cartoon which I loved, uh, actually back from the 70s, of a picture of a, a, a bunch of people marching down the street with placards, you know, stop the war, you know, world peace, da da da, whatever it is, um, you know, stating from the, for each of those individuals what they see the purpose of them being there is 
and what's their main objective. And right up the back, there's a bloke up the back with a sign that says, I hate my father. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes what draws people into um, groups and what you think you're going for isn't necessarily a shared understanding. And that can cause problems in, 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 in itself. Mm. So part of the challenge there is to allow enough space and provide the, um, the opportunity to do that sharing about, you know, why are we here? You know, what's your story? How did you decide to, and we just did an exercise a bit like that as a, as a woman. You know, what, what brought you to uh, transition towns? Why, why um, do you think it's something that's valuable and worth doing? And what do you hope to get out of it? Now, I don't know, I have no idea what you've done in each of your groups to date, but um, that and being, uh, and allowing that opportunity also for any new people who come in. So, uh, creating that space so that you not only know that, yeah, you know, this person's great, they've come along, they're really good at, you know, organic gardening or whatever the particular skill or, 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 or um, a driver that's brought them in, but, but who are they? And, and you know, you can actually work differently with people if you know a little bit about where they're coming from. You can also, you know, realise, for example, well, you know, maybe the reason that that person got really defensive about that is because I know a little bit about who they are and why they're behaving that way. And how we behave in groups is determined by a whole range of factors, not, not the least, you know, our childhood, our history, our experiences. And so know, in knowing, taking time to know people um, is, is really, um, essential. And often we can get, and I'm one of the worst at it, uh, preoccupied with the tasks and the outcomes and the time frames and the, you know, <coughs> oh my goodness, we have to have this done by that because otherwise the world's going to end. Um, and sometimes that's true, but <laughs> often it's not. <laughs> uh, and so it's uh, important to emphasise that the maintenance of the group is as important as the outcome. And that's that adage about the journey being as important as the destination. Um, and how we are together will uh, determine the quality and the durability of the outcomes. So it's, and, and one of the things, depending on the, the forces that have brought a group together and the kind of understandings about what the journey is, gives permission to do that kind of work. Because a lot of, you know, we, we all go into um, different, um, if you're the sort of person who joins groups, and probably, you know, I'd say most of you probably are, if you recognise that there's an advantage in working with other people, you know, we make a decision, okay, it's important that this gets done, and there's a group there that's doing it, so I'm going to join them so we can maximise what we can get out of that together. But we don't all have the same experience or knowledge about how to work together. And it's certainly not something that gets taught, you know, and I think it should be taught to school personally, how to actually um, uh, work effectively in groups. Um, so often we, we don't have that, that, that framework. Um, and uh, it's saying it would be good to pay attention to establishing that framework to, ma to maximise what we get out of, of working together. Now, some of the keys to that effective group work are, in my opinion, and I've tried the kind of standard model, you know, the, um, <laughs> I have a proposal, but, you know, speaker for, speaker against, <laughs> all those in favour, you know, uh, raise your hand, uh, which is the kind of standard um, meeting procedure, as, as I understand it, a lot of groups, like local like councils, parliament, rah, rah. Uh, Community organising, um, and certainly there's a whole tradition um, in, in social change, um, says that making decisions by consensus is actually a better way to engage people, to maximise the, um, uh, the synthesis of di different people's you know, uh, abilities and knowledge and, um, and energies. Um, but often it's not done well. Um, and it, often it becomes more like a, just an informal sort of way of, oh, you know, what do you think? Oh, yeah, what do you think? Okay, well, we'll do that. Now, um, I would encourage, and I'm sure many of you have uh, uh, done some, some 
more detailed work on understanding exactly what good consensus looks like. Because consensus done badly can be as frustrating as, as the sort of simple majority model, which basically says, well, you might end up with 51% you know, of the room is really happy and the other 49% are going to do everything they can to make sure that that never happens because um, <laughs> we didn't get what we wanted. <laughs> um, you know, politics. <laughs> Federal politics is a good example at the moment. So how do you avoid that? Um, and how do you actually have uh, a, um, um, an understanding of a decision-making process that um, is inclusive, is... Um, uh, considerate of the group wisdom. One of the fundamental tenets of consensus is that um, the, the, the wisdom of the group is always going to be uh, more powerful than uh, those of one or two individuals who might want to drive a certain outcome through, through a process. Um, but uh, to do it well, um, one of the um, fundamental things is, is good facilitation. and. Um, that also requires some understanding and some practicing in terms of doing that well. And I thought it would be worth just spending a couple of minutes talking about facilitation um, because uh, to me it's, it's absolutely core to um, having uh, a group function well and um, to uh, not only get the job done but also to enjoy the experience along the way. Um, and again, facilitation is something that can be done um, well or, <coughs> or badly. So, I thought I might, I, and I, I should say, what I've got under the, my chair here is some take-home um, sheets. So you don't need to sort of remember everything. Um, I've got a, a handout on facilitation and a handout on consensus. Because um, in 45 minutes we're never done it. I probably need a couple of days to do it really thoroughly. Um, so I'm, um, I've got some material here which also has some uh, further reading and, and, and a follow-up if, if you uh, find it useful. But what I'm going to refer to initially is uh, a, a basic information sheet about good meeting facilitation, which actually um, comes from uh, Seeds for Change in the UK. Uh, and um, one of the things in this um, in this area of, of group dynamics is um, you'll find that there's some excellent resources and they've all got their um, slight cultural sort of um, uh, leanings. This one's an English one and the one on consensus is actually uh, 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 from America, um, largely based on um, uh, Quaker um, process in terms of consensus, but also a really good resource. So, first thing to say about facilitation is it's, it's, it's quite, has some overlap with the more traditional role of chairing a meeting, but it is fundamentally different. Um, and in fact, a good facilitator is almost invisible because a good facilitator won't be the one who's driving an outcome. They're actually the one that holds the space open for everybody to engage in the process and to reach whatever agreement they can about the best outcome for the whole group. Um, so it is uh, a role that um, it requires considerable <coughs> energy and focus and attention, not just to the <coughs> following the uh, the input from members uh, of that group, <coughs> but also checking things like, you know, where's the energy of the group at the moment? Are people paying attention? Are they all kind of looking at the watch and, you know, hoping that <coughs> they could all stop soon because they're tired or because this is just going on too long or... Um, uh, they obviously disagree, but they're not willing to, say, interrupt them. You know, that person who always has the best ideas and they're going to talk about them for the next half an hour. Oh, thanks. Thanks, <coughs> um, So it's um, having a very uh, um, mindful um, view on what's actually happening. You know, and, and we mentioned about circles. I mean, one of the reasons why, and again, I'm sure a lot of you have <laughs> Have know this and have observed it. The, the dynamic of conversations which are held in circles are different to the dynamic of conversations that are held in straight lines with somebody sitting out in front. Um, and, and you know, we all remember what school classes were like, um, and who sat where and why, and that kind of thing. You know, so where you position yourself, and the fact that you know, uh, 
one of the key things with <coughs> a consensus model is that you know, sitting in circles is actually a really effective way to um, bring everybody into the light about that one. <coughs> everybody into the process. <coughs> But of course, it's not as simple as that. There are other there are other elements that mean that um, the contribution is is not going to be equal straight away just by 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 some sort of magic. You have to actually actively <coughs> employ some tools, for example, to make sure that everybody gets a chance to participate. Some people have some great ideas and sit back there and they're thinking about it and they've got you know fantastic contribution, but unless they're actually asked. And, and often women uh, are in that category, um, just because culturally, you know, that job, um, we're, um, uh, have been, um, maybe not so much now, but certainly in my generation, you know, you were taught, you, you kind of sat back and you know, let other people take, take the, the floor. So there are some, some quite simple tools about ensuring that um, equal participation is, is at least available. Uh, for example, you know, you do go-arounds, you actually keep speaking lists and you don't continue to give the call to people who've had the last five goes. Say, so, okay, I want to hear from somebody who hasn't said anything yet. Give them the opportunity. Some people, you actually need to create space because they need an invitation to participate. They're not going to uh, push their way in. That's just one simple example. Um, another, another example of, of how to... Um, change the, uh, the, the dynamic and the energy in a group, of course, is using um, uh, humour and games and engagement and opportunities like that Bar did to start. What happened when we did that at the beginning of this week? It immediately lifted the energy. It immediately created this buzz in the room. It meant that, um, you know, for people who maybe hadn't had a chance to chat, anybody, to, chat to, to anybody when they got here, felt that they engaged. You know, I, I, I had great conversations with two people I spoke to. So you kind of, you're already, you know, uh, ready for the what's next. Um, and too often what we do is plow on <coughs> and on and on and on because somehow we think that that's going to um, uh, 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 get, get the task done. Whereas sometimes it's worth saying, hey, look, I think really what's happening now is everybody's actually really um, got no attention or we need to have a break. Um, maybe we, if we do this for five minutes, then when we come back, we'll actually have the capacity to, to deal with this problem. Or, or to perhaps say, do we really need to make this decision now? You know, let's look at whether this can be uh, uh, postponed because we need more information. You know, Often you keep going, oh, I'm trying to think of an answer for this. And in fact, the problem is that you don't have enough information in the room to make that decision. Um, so it's kind of being clear about, uh, about those sort of... Um, understandings about how decisions get made. Now, the other thing about um, facilitating is um, practicing some of the um, the, 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 the tools um, and having making the time and having permission from the group to do that outside of the tasks that you want to do. And some of that kind of learning stuff is actually really fun. You know, there's some great exercises and again, because this is really just a taster, um, about um, learning uh, the roles that each of us play in groups. Um, so there's fishbowl exercises, which are one of my favourites, um, where you actually say, okay, let's say we recognise that this group isn't functioning at, at its best and that there's a dynamic which keeps on blocking us from getting here or, you know, there's um, a certain sort of dominant conversation that always seems to take over and, and I'm not happy with that because I would, I would rather have the group, you know, be more harmonious or whatever it is. So one of the ways you can actually examine that in a kind of uh, a more neutral way is to artificially create uh, a decision that has to be made. You know, which restaurant are we going to go to after we finish this evening? Um, you know, and you 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 ask the um, half of the people to make the decision and the other half of the people to observe what happens. Who plays what role? What goes wrong? Uh, was everybody involved in the decision? Um, was everybody happy with the decision? And it's absolutely fascinating, having done this exercise in a huge number of different contexts, 
um, it reveals uh, the, the roles that we play. And it's not in terms of saying, well, you're wrong or, you know, whatever. It's about saying, okay, gee, I didn't realise I was always the one who kind of jumped in and said, okay, I think what's happening here is we need to solve this problem like this. Now, some people will automatically jump into those kind of roles, and sometimes that's okay. But sometimes that other people feel like, you know, you've just taken over the entire process, and I'm not really happy with that. Uh, so it's about um, uh, talking uh, about how we uh, are with each other, how respectful, how uh, good we are at listening, um, how, um, uh, how engaged we are uh, in, 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 in the processes. So um, I would encourage uh, that you know, for any group, it's good to make some time to play around with some of this stuff. See if it does make your, your, your meetings more interesting. See if it does deepen the way that you're working with people. Because, as I said right at the beginning, one of the exciting things I think about the transition movement is it's not just about tangible outcomes, but it's about rebuilding community. And that is so desperately needed. You know, uh, uh, um, and the fact that it's sort of at a, um, a local level, it's about engaging the people in your own area. Uh, the, the, the potential there is, is very exciting. But it's also, I think, really would be fantastic if we could also maximise the, the kind of um, the fun we get out of it and, and the, uh, the depth with which we can work together. Um, so if you are in a group that, for example, you might be fortunate enough to get a collective of people together and find that some people have already got quite good level of skills in terms of um, running meetings and, um, and uh, facilitation. Or you might find that you just, if you feel you don't have enough of those skills, so okay, where do you go to, to, to try and uh, raise that up? And uh, that can be quite challenging, especially if you've already got um, you know, some challenges within your group. You know. Have we got time to step back and look at how we're doing this and see if there's a way that we can um, uh, maximise the enjoyment and the productivity of, of the meeting uh, and, and what we're trying to do together. <clears throat> so I'm just going to finish off with the tip, top tips for facilitators, which is on the back of the sheet. Um, really critical to um, uh, whatever you're meeting, even if it's a relatively informal meeting, to be clear about what your agenda is. Now your agenda might be we're getting together to, to have a barbecue and we're not going to do anything, we're not going to do any work. We're just going to be you know, social. That in itself is, is kind of an agenda. But it's, you know those meetings where there's a crossover between are we really being social or are we actually getting business done? Mm -hmm. uh, and some people work well within that sort of general you know, uh, lack of, uh, of, of definition. Um, but sometimes it's really good to know this bit social and this bit, let's get the work done and then we can, you know, all have a meal or whatever it is. Mixing the two together can sometimes um, uh, confuse people and waste energy. Uh, be realistic about what uh, any meeting can achieve. Um, you know, how many times do we have agendas that are just, you know, I'm um, just thinking about a meeting that I was at um, last Saturday. I think the agenda, the agenda <laughs> was huge and uh, everybody got exhausted by the end of the afternoon. Um, so be realistic, set time limits and tackle all the points. Um, even if that is to say, we won't have time for this, you need to be really clear about when that's going to be um, revisited. Um, be aware of both content and process. I guess that's, that's my major emphasis that I've um, been putting on this morning. Um, keep group moving towards its aims. And so regularly check in are we are we meeting those aims um, you know I sort of I ensure that there is a an evaluation point um, not necessarily at every meeting but at certain points um, because I think it's, it's it's really important to check back in not only are we meeting these aims within our expected sort of time frames and, and, and how well we've met them but also, how are we going together? Are we are we enjoying this? Should we be doing, you know, some more fun things? We can learn. Because Emma always says we ought to be having more fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
which didn't happen very often in the parliamentary office, <laughs> we did our best. Um, uh, use a variety of facilitation tools to keep everyone interested. Create a safe and empowering atmosphere to get the best contribution for everybody. And put a stop to domineering, interrupting, put downs and guilt trips. So that is the kind of 10, all of the top tips for facilitators. Um, what else do I want to say? Those were, the, those were the main things. And what I was going to say now, in the next half an hour a bit, is to throw it open to questions or discussion or invite people to say, well, uh, you know, up to you. It doesn't have to be about the group you're in at the moment, but it might be your experience in groups or in, in decision making uh, more broadly. Um, you know, this is what worked for my group, or I, you know, we're up against this problem, has anybody got any ideas how we move beyond that? Because I haven't even touched on how you deal with tricky things and um, the inevitable uh, tensions and conflicts come up because we're people, you know, and I really can't stand it myself, so it does whatever. You know. <laughs> even though you might kind of dearly want them in your group and you've got the same aims, sometimes they're, they're, there are reasons why um, we find it easier to work with some people and more difficult to work with others. But there are ways and there are tools of, of um, uh, at least uh, improving the outcome. Within the United States in activism and um, came home for family reasons mostly, got plugged into the activist scene here of course, keeping with my politics. And one of the things that I noticed was that there's a core cultural difference between the way that activism is done in the United States and the way it's done here. In the United States there's this, um, this baseline um, cultural expectation that if you've got an initiative or you're, you're driven towards leadership in something, the Yanks do this, this whole thing, whoop, 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 you know. <laughs> Whereas what we do here is we cut each other down, we've got this whole office and thing. And I've really smacked into that myself, I think, you know, you probably know me well enough, you know, even that we don't get to hang out a lot, but, you know, I've got a big personality, I take up space, I've got lots of ideas, I've got energy and verb, and a lot of people will interpret that as me either being domineering, being a bloke, being a gender theorist and actually feminist trained a lot of people don't realise that I actually have a sensitivity around gender issues. So there's a whole bunch of assumption that can can come with this whole tension between tall, tall poppy syndrome and also getting stuff done. And some of the stuff that you're, you've spoken to is right in the bullseye of many of the, the frustrations that I've run into in my leadership role. And what it ends up landing like, and you might, some of you, if any of you have done uh, co-counseling, recognise this is that um, the, the notion of a tax on leadership and the, the way to do consensus but to also then be productive and not attack each other in the process in this cultural context. That's the question I want to put forward. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's pretty good stuff. Um, and I think thanks for, for sharing that because that, that's an interesting thing. You raise the issue of, of some cultural differences yeah. um, and um, uh, so we all operate within our own cultural experience and cultural norms, and I agree. Um, generally in Australia, um, you want to kind of float just a little bit below the, 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 the ramparts. <laughs> um, but I think there are ways of, of, of valuing that level of energy and input and um, leadership qualities. Um, uh, and one of the things is for example, the fact that you, you shared that like that, you go, okay, so Paul's like this and that, and maybe that's because, you know, this is how he, he, he is in the world and I shouldn't be interpreting that as being, you know, taking up too much space or being domineering because, you know, he's just given me a story about yeah. why that is. Uh, and the flip side of that also, I guess, is um, if, if one is a fairly, and I would probably put myself in the same category, you know, you come in a group and you're going, okay, well, I'm waiting for, you know, you know, to see who's going to put their hand up to do something. And after about, you know, <laughs> five minutes, I'm going, well, okay. <laughs> you know, because it just can't, you know, it just happens. You think this needs, maybe an assumption or a thought that this needs some direction or this needs some uh, vocalising and you jump in. Um, so I know for myself, often I go, mm -mm. Just, just, you know, you actually have to sit on it for a little while uh, and um, wait. 
a bit longer. Now, that requires a certain discipline. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not saying that's appropriate every time, but sometimes it's, it's useful. It doesn't mean that you won't get to have your input, but some people are quite... Um, Well, and also are put off if, 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 if they think, oh, okay, well, they're going, that person's going to do it. I'm not needed. So there's, there's also that mm -hmm. issue about people have decided to come and work in a group together. It probably is because they think they've got something to contribute. Oh, they might also want to get stuff out. But if it's always the case that the same people are always, I mean, they're good at this, they, they put their hand up first, they get on with it. Well, or maybe I don't need to be in this group because it's already all been done. Um, and that might be okay, or it might be you know, better that some of those skills, like you know, uh, how is it that you feel that you have the, the, the enthusiasm and the capacity to jump in and say, oh, I can help you. How do we share those skills? Because for me, leadership is actually a whole range of, um, of skills and attributes that can be and not only shared, uh, but also learnt. Um, and so, uh, you know, the most dynamic and effective group is where everybody takes leadership roles in their own area. And we recognise that leadership is uh, um, a, a series of, or, or a range of, um, of, of, of skills and attributes. And it might be that leadership is seen as who creates this space so that the group can um, be most effective? Who um, uh, sits back and says, okay, this isn't working, why isn't it working? Doesn't mean that you have to have the answer, but you recognise <coughs> that that, um, that something's not chilling. So that in itself is a leadership role to say, okay, hang on a sec, let's just take a step back. And the, sometimes the problem and the conflict isn't what you think it is. It's actually something else that's that's bubbling away underneath, and you need to talk about that, otherwise you'll never get to fix the other bit. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. facilitation, I strongly recommend Chris's work. There's also a very good book called The Complete Facilitator's Handbook by John Heron. And that goes into everything you could ever possibly want to know about facilitation. That's one thing. The second thing, I'd like to also strongly recommend the fact that you've done the course with Otto Sharma. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who gets Otto Sharma's book, Theory U, or his latest work, is also very good for facilitators. Uh, the final thing I'd like to throw open for discussion is the myth of leadership. <laughs> when you read, if you do a Google search on leadership, you get 419 million hits. On Google, you do a search on followership, and you get a few thousand. The myth of leadership is that uh, leaders are born and not made, or that leaders are made by the circumstances they find themselves in, or that you can train leaders. And when you look at the lists of leadership characteristics, it reads like the list of Superman or Superwoman. And when you look at leaders in history, none of them have the list of characteristics that leaders are supposed to have. <laughs> the thing that makes a leader is not the leader, it's the follower. And we need to focus more, I think, instead of looking at what leadership's all about, looking about what followership is. Because leaders are created by the consent of the followers. If you have people who consent to follow the leader, then you've got a leader. If you don't have people who consent or people who withdraw their consent, no one can lead. It's the followers that make the leader, not the leader. And so what we need to do, I think, is focus our energy much more on being good followers rather than being good leaders. And if you look at the characteristics of good followership, it makes very, very interesting reading. Leadership, the myths about leadership, the three things that I spoke about, is in fact a myth that is created by people who want to dominate. They want to take control. And in fact, it's not leaders that make the situation, it's the people who are prepared to follow them that make the situation. And so I think we've got the, the cart before the horse in very many cases. The final thing I'd like to say is that um, it's about lists of uh, group agreements. 
one of the problems with lists of group agreements is that the human mind can only hold about seven unrelated pieces of information. If you've got a list of group agreements that has got more than seven points, it's probable that a number of these points will be forgotten about and not used. So I'd strongly recommend that you limit your group agreements to seven or under. The other thing too, there's a very good reference by Starhawk just come out on collaborative groups and she's got an excellent list of a group agreements uh, for collaborative groups in there. And um, I'd invi invite everyone who's interested in exploring this to get hold of Starhawk's latest book on collaborative groups and look at what she says about agreements on how to negotiate them in a group. So that's just some resources and some ideas about leadership, so I'll throw them out to the group. I'd be interested in anyone's comments. Yeah, thanks, John. There's lots of really good resources. In and I, I, I definitely concur with the analysis of, of, of leadership in that. Um, uh, I mean, I think, the, and the thing about following is, often, is actually often people feel, I mean, why they choose to, pl to play a following role rather than leadership role is that they feel inadequate um, or, um, uh, um, unmotivated, you know, disinterested, or or even lazy, you know, like oh god, well, let somebody else make that, take that, you know, take that on, and then there's a kind of resentment about the fact that somebody else is getting. <laughs>